A leader's role as a communicator is undoubtedly one of their most important. We know that history holds its greatest communicators in lasting memory. Barack Obama, Steve Jobs, maybe Greg Searle is going to get on the list soon as well. <laughs> it's through a leader's communication that everything else happens. But it is a tough and complex task to master. In fact, communication works for people who work at it. Today, we want to talk to you about one part of a leader's communication role, and that's their responsibility to communicate under pressure. So taking some lessons from the world of broadcasting and broadcast journalism, we're going to use that as a metaphor to think about what we and the leaders we work with can learn from communication in another discipline. Before we kick off, and for those of you who don't know me or who I haven't worked with, I'm Natalie Benjamin and I lead Lane 4's communication and engagement practice, which means I spend my time working with leaders and those responsible for change communication to devise communication programs or strategies that have an impact on business performance and deliver that sustained performance that we're all after and that we've been talking about today. But I spent a few years in PR, public affairs, before I joined Lane 4 and I worked in employee engagement and started to specialise in this field. But I actually started my career as a broadcast journalist, which is particularly relevant today. And I've actually always been fascinated by what we in organisations can learn from fast-paced news reporting. And that's something we're going to cover today. And I am delighted to be welcomed, to welcome Hannah Tallett, <laughs> Hannah Tallett, a former colleague and peer of mine, from Sky News, Sky News presenter and senior producer, who's going to share some stories that we hope will be relevant for you today. Before she kicks off, let's just take a moment to look at Sky News at its very best over the last year. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Natalie, for that introduction. My name is Hannah Tallett, and I'm a senior producer and presenter at Sky News, where I've worked for about five years now. But my career in journalism has been about seven or eight years, and in that time, I've always worked in 24-hour newsrooms. Now, I make the, stress of, uh, make the point of stressing rather my sort of round-the-clock news background because I think that newsrooms are effectively pressure cookers. They are adrenaline-fueled, stressful, fun, and always completely unpredictable, which is 24 hours a day. So I hope that my experience of uh, working across a newsroom from both behind the camera and in front of the camera presentation will give you a small insight into how we handle breaking news at Sky and how we communicate those stories while under pressure. So you saw in that short film, which I've only actually just seen for the first time as well, Sky News at its very best. For me, 24-hour newsrooms are best when they're being reactive first and proactive second. And what I mean by reactive is when you take a story and suddenly a whole team of, of newsroom staff all pull together to try to develop that story over time, but you've had no time in, in the, that instance to actually prepare for it. And it's only then after you've sort of broken the, the headline news that the proactive element kicks in. You'll often hear journalists talking about whether a story is moving or not. Does it have legs? That's the process, effectively, of, of taking a story from its inception as a headline and watching it develop and grow over the course of a number of hours, days. And that, in very, very crude terms, is what I do. I break news and develop breaking news stories and judge when a story has run out of legs. So today I wanted to uh, draw on two aspects of communication which I personally feel are mutually dependent and completely invaluable in almost every aspect of communication with, within a newsroom. And they are simplicity and trust. Simplicity in the message that we broadcast and trust amongst our colleagues and with our sources of information are completely imperative. In, in essence, they, they are what keeps Sky News ticking over. So first, I thought it might be quite helpful when we're talking about how breaking news can be difficult, how it can be hard, to give you an idea of, of how news breaks. I understand that, that lots of people wouldn't necessarily know what goes on behind the scenes. There is a hierarchy of staff at Sky. So when a story is breaking, it goes something like this. News agencies such as Reuters or the Associated Press, or perhaps a, a viewer or a, a, just a member of the public, or a member of staff will call into the news desk. Now, the news desk is essentially the hub of the newsroom. It's, it's if you like, the, the hot desk in a call center. They will then give that first instant bit of information to the news editor. The news editor then goes and tells the on-air output team, sat about a meter and a half away from him, he or she. And then the chief sub-writer on the uh, on-air output team, who's effectively the second in command, 
then squawks through in a very kind of like, uh, you know, roger that over and out kind of way to the gallery, to the producer in the gallery. The producer in the gallery, who by the way is on an open microphone the whole time, and then notes down what the headline piece of information is. The text producer sat next to the executive producer, then starts getting all the on-screen furniture ready. You saw in that film the, the yellow ticker at the bottom of the screen and the red straps and things like that. Then the producer tells the presenter, and that all goes in through your, your earpiece. So at the time, the producer's telling the director and the presenter what the latest line is, and often, as a presenter, you're, you're already talking or reading out a story about something completely different. So you're speaking whilst taking in something completely new, which is interesting. And before you know it, you get all the flash whiz, pop, bang, and all the rest of it, and it's breaking news from, for, here at Sky News Centre, and whatever it is. Now, all the while, that takes about 30 seconds. All the while, the output producers back outside in the newsroom are writing up the story, getting uh, contributors on the phone, expert ana analysis to try and react to the story, editing pictures, moving pictures, anything that's an uh, old file picture, whatever it is that's hopefully related to the story. And the news desk has already deployed a huge number of staff, reporters, uh, camera operators, satellite trucks, whatever it might be, uh, to the scene to try and get the, the first live pictures to air. Now, if at any point in that chain of effect, the trust element breaks down, the momentum can instantly be lost. And before you know it, the BBC or someone with uh, res more resource resources deployed at a local level has suddenly taken the initiative. Or worse still, the momentum is lost and the whole story is completely distorted. I think it was quite a few years ago now that, that one presenter accidentally killed off a very famous playwright when in fact the playwright in question had been awarded a Nobel Prize. So who knows how that one had got so mixed up. So why is breaking news hard as a presenter? Well, I have to trust my colleagues. I have to be honest with my audience. I have absolutely no way of directly communicating with the source of the story until perhaps much further down the line when that person, person's family member, a politician, police, whoever it might be, would then be available for interview. So in the immediate instance of breaking news, I have to hope that the message has been kept simple and hasn't been distorted in some kind of Chinese whisper style way. When it gets to me, it must be truthful, simple, and honest. The honesty is vital. The audience will only trust me if I'm honest about what I know and how I know it. It's uh, the old familiar journalist riddle that Natalie will be well familiar with as well from our journalism school days, because it was drummed into us every single day, of who, what, where, when, and why. Keep it simple. Give the facts, lose the fluff. Breaking news is also hard because it automatically implies that you're working in a, in a more pressurized environment. So even if those ideals of simplicity and trust are upheld, people can be quite abrasive. Communication has to happen quickly. Speed is of the essence. Add to that the fact that most communication in the, that immediate term is not about face-to-face -face communication. That's not just from the presenter's point of view, but also for, for staff as well in the newsroom. Everyone's uh, what they, we affectionately term phone bashing, which is when you're trying to get co uh, contributors to talk to us and people bash the phone down. Um, I've mentioned before that people, we, we talk to the gallery through this very unsubtle, loud sort of squawk box, as it's called. It's effectively a fixed walkie-talkie, which is constantly on open talkback. So it, diplomacy is crucial. Everyone can hear what you say. Now, as I mentioned before, as a presenter, you're hardly ever talking to a face. You're just talking down the barrel, straight to a camera. Now, I find it's important, and I think probably most other presenters as well would say it's important to imagine that you're talking to someone. Imagine someone's in that camera and you're talking to a face. After all, it's, it's the interaction that we have with others that determine then our, our own reaction. So that's in your body language, your facial expressions, just the intonation in your voice as well. It doesn't always go well, of course. I once broke a news story about an earthquake in Chile. There was no script, so I was just ad-libbing the latest piece of information that I had on it. A breaking news into us here at Sky News Center. An earthquake measuring 4.1 in magnitude has struck off the Chilean coast. Now, of course, in hindsight, 4.1 is really nothing more than a shudder. Uh, but I got it wrong and potentially caused unnecessary alarm and concern by my look of surprise. The facts in that instant were accurate, but it was the context that was wrong. 
I'd like to give you some, um, some more examples of, of breaking news, and one story in particular. If I can ask you to take your minds back to August this year and the search for the missing schoolgirl Tia Sharp. Now, one week on, and after numerous searches uh, by police and the local community in South London, and at about 5.30 on a Friday afternoon, the police announced that they had found a body. And about an hour after that, they confirmed that Tia's grandmother's boyfriend was missing and had, as a result, become the prime suspect. Now, I was on air from 7 p.m. till 9 that evening. The story was breaking. All of our resources, resources had been deployed to the scene. We had uh, the sky copter hovering above, getting us all the live pictures from the scene of forensic officers going in and out of Tia's grandmother's house. But there was no script again, there was no rundown, which is sort of a running order telling you what you're supposed to do next. All I had was a, a very trustworthy, a very good, faithful colleague talking in my ear the whole way through, saying what he wanted me to go to next, or what he wanted us to, to, me to talk to uh, next. So I just thought it would be a good idea to give you just a short snippet of how that story developed over the uh, two hours that I was on air. This is Sky News with Hannah Tallett. Hello, very good evening. A body has been found at the home of Tia Sharp's grandmother. A murder inquiry now uh, underway, but first and foremost, uh, your thoughts must go out, I guess, to the family. I mean, just the most tragic news uh, after a week of searching. Like a lot of other things, let's not all start jumping to conclusions. Yeah, obviously very important to stress that. Also important to stress that no arrests have been made uh, thus far and also no formal identification has been made of the body found uh, in that house. And Tom, uh, devastating news for this community, a community that had rallied around so much over the last week in the, in the desperate hope to find Tia safe and well. One would assume that a, a body would have been discovered had it been there for all that time. Yes, absolutely. And let me take you back, if I may, to my days as a detective. Sorry, if we can actually bring you Martin Brunt now, who's got some more breaking news from the scene in New Addington. Martin. Stuart, Hazel's, uh, Stuart Hazel is now in custody. Stuart Hazel, Tia Sharp's grandmother's partner, has been arrested and uh, will now be undergoing questioning by police. Plenty more on this coming up at the top of the hour. And so we were all under pressure that day, both on screen and behind the camera, to get the facts right and to be honest about what we knew, and also not to libel anyone or potentially prejudice any, any future trial that might come about. I had to try and communicate with the audience what they wanted to know. Now, most of the time, as a, as a journalist, you're not directly involved in the story. It doesn't directly affect you. Um, you're presenting on behalf of the audience. But in this case, it just it pulls on the heartstrings so much that you can't help but feel involved. And as many of you, I'm sure, will know, that unfortunately the Tia Sharp story was just the first in a, in a string of missing children stories that have broken since then, uh, since back in August. So the, the key for me is to empathise with the audience. The Sky News' viewing figures that evening were some of, among the highest of the year, and I, I hope that shows that we did it well and that we acted responsibly as an information broadcaster. Uh, another example of being an information broadcaster would be the London riots, which you saw some clips of in the initial film that we showed. At that point, all the audience wants to know, all the viewer wants to know, is exactly what's going on at that time. How are the young people around London mo mobilising themselves? How are they organising themselves? Where's the trouble, the trouble? Where is it spreading to? What's the police reaction? Broadcasting, for me, is always all about communicating as a public service, even if you're not the BBC. Again, it doesn't always work. Sometimes the trust breaks down. For example, based on a source he had at the Foreign Office, Adam Bolton, our political editor, broke the news live on air that the Lockerbie bomber Abdel Basit al-Megrahi had died. Now, it was only when one of the producers in the newsroom called al-Megrahi's doctor, his oncologist, and asked for some comment on it that we realised that al-Megrahi was very much still alive, the doctor was in the same room as him, and he'd just spoken to him. So most unfortunately for Adam, he had to go live on air and retract his breaking news line. Now, Al McGrath, he did die, of course, about a year later, and yes, we did double and triple check that he had passed. Looking at the legal quandary that you can find yourselves in when on air, the Ryan Giggs super injunction affair, which I'm sure many of you will remember. 
Now, at the time, social media, Twitter in particular, had repeatedly named the Manchester United striker as the footballer who had gained a super injunction to try to prevent uh, any details of an alleged extramarital affair he'd had uh, going public. Now, Sky News often broadcasts live coverage from the House of Commons, and on one day, um, an MP was stood in the Commons, and he, using his parliamentary privilege, protecting him from any legal action, he named Ryan Giggs, and we, in turn, broadcast that. The, the problem for Sky is that we're not covered by parliamentary privilege. So the presenter at the time, Lorna Dunkley, my colleague, she was very, very tentative about what she could say. Could she name him, even though we'd just put it out on air? At that time, she was totally reliant on trusting the producer who was talking to her, the producer who was in the gallery, feeding information to her through her ear. One wrong move, one wrong sentence, and Lorna and Sky could have been uh, both liable for legal action. I think in the end she qualified the headline enough, and it read something like this. An MP has just used his parliamentary privilege to name Ryan Giggs as the footballer at the centre of a growing debate about super injunctions after the striker reportedly secured one following an alleged affair with a colleague's girlfriend. <laughs> yes, it's very long-winded, and it hardly falls into the simplicity category, but it does work. So can you prepare for breaking news? Well, in short, yes. Every story pretty much takes the same format. It's, t it's TV, so you want to get picture on air straight away. So you know that's either going to be photographs or if you've got moving footage, then you'll use that. Uh, you know that you're going to immediately be speaking to contributors and reporters or anyone who would have something to say about that story, basically. And also you're trying to get the first live pictures to air as soon as possible. So yes, I'm always on alert, expecting the unexpected and knowing that whatever the story is, it will broadly follow the same format. Is it stressful? Yes. But the pressure builds because of the adrenaline, and that's for all of the staff at Sky. It's a good thing. It keeps everyone on their toes. And like I said at the beginning, that's when I think we're best, when we're, we're reacting to something. When it comes to filtering information, it's important to be able to take all that adrenaline and, and put it all into bite-sized chunks of information. Everything you say has to be uh, digestible and concise. Now, I talked earlier about having a face in the camera that you talk to as a presenter. Now, for, that's always my mum. And in truth, if she could be, I'm sure she'd be sat at the back right now. Um, and I'll just pretend that she is, because that's probably easier for me. At three o'clock in the morning, sometimes it is nice to think, well, uh, sometimes it, you can't help but think that she is the only one watching. And although I have told her that Sky has a worldwide audience, and we cover lots of different time zones, and she really needn't set her alarm for the top of the hour headlines, she still does. But it, it does help to, for me to talk to her because, like I said before, it's something about your facial mannerisms, your body language as well. It makes you more personable in the way you're, you're communicating. The old trick is to imagine that whatever you're saying, you're saying it to your friends in the pub and you've got a pint in your hand. Pub speak is instantly more engaging than any kind of jargon or lingo or legalese or anything like that that's just a complete turn off and most of the time just goes straight over people's heads. They just don't listen. I have to put myself in the shoes of the person who is listening and who might be directly affected by what I'm saying. When you're interviewing, the presenter's role is largely to play devil's advocate. Everyone, someone out there will ultimately always disagree with whatever, say, the politician has just said. So it's not my job to give that politician a, a free platform. It's my job to then basically ask them a question which completely contradicts what they've just said. And politicians are well trained in this, they're well versed in this, so you know, it doesn't always go to plan, but that's the idea anyway. They know to expect the critical question, irrespective of the policy that they've perhaps just put forward. Again, the key is simplicity and trust. Be on the side of your audience. I'm never trying to persuade a, uh, uh, anyone or call any group of people to arms. I'm just trying to build trust with them so I can get their point of view across and get their questions answered. So in conclusion, I hope that, that the stories that I've given you today give you a slight insight into my workplace. And I know you all operate in a different environment, but I do think there are uh, parallels to be drawn, and I'm sure Natalie's going to pick up on some of them now. But I'd just like to leave you with this one thought, and this is the main, uh, the main aspect for me. Communicating a message simply does not make that message simplistic. It makes it engaging, believable, and honest. Thank you.
Thanks, Hannah, and I hope that that's got everybody thinking. I'm sure you're already drawing some parallels and maybe some differences. Before I start to share some of the things I've noticed that may be similar or different, I just want to say that every time I see that, and we've prepared and we've talked about this for quite a while, but every time I see those clips and hear those stories, I think something slightly different. And even just today, it's occurred to me that journalists and the media have had a tough gig over the last couple of years, and rightly so, rightly so for some of the things that have gone on. But free press is at the heart of democracy, and we are so, so lucky to have it. And when I see the currency of that footage and what journalists are doing at, when they're at their best, I feel really proud of what we've got here. Leaders have to be dealing with very similar sources of pressure, dealing with ambiguity, visible and vulnerable, and breaking news that people don't want to hear. There were so many parallels that Hannah talked about. I can name just a couple. Keeping an audience member in mind, Hannah talked about her mother. My parents are actually at the back. <laughs> Learning to thrive on pressure. I think you talked about using that adrenaline and it enabling it to keep you on your toes. We talked in the session Will ran earlier about identifying your sources of pressure and how you might be able to cope with them. The same is true. Managing your own emotion and body language. In fact, when Hannah first told me the story about the Chile earthquake, I, I didn't get it because, of course, I don't know what 4.1 is on the Richter scale either, but I can imagine how it would have felt seeing somebody's reaction. And exactly how you can prepare, even when the content's not there, so Hannah talked about reacting to news, but being able to prepare, getting the trucks out, getting the skycopter out, getting things in place. And of course, we can do that in organisations. Processes and communication processes we know can be put in place, behavioural and technical development. And also getting our leaders to practice having tough conversations. Zara talked earlier about, as well about 10,000 hours of practice until you're an expert at something. And actually some of the tough conversations in organisations, creating a culture where people can be courageous is the role of leaders. But I'm really struck, I was the first time we talked about it, by simplicity and trust. It's the first thing we talked about when we planned the session and actually abstract and complex communication from our leaders that we've got way too accepting of. Our own jargon, our own way of communicating isn't clever and doesn't help people to engage with something. It makes trust tougher, it makes engagement harder. Making something that's really complex, simple, and delivering it as you, because you mean it, is what makes or breaks leadership communication. Onto the newsroom and how it feels to be part of the newsroom. I only did this for a year, a year and a half, but I remember very, very vividly that high pressure and that abrasive communication that Hannah talked about. I don't look at anyone in my team, but coupled with high trust. Make... Sorry. I'm not here to advocate that, that would be wrong, I think, in a group of HR professionals, of course. But what it does make me think is how performance-focused those conversations are in a newsroom. So there is no time to soften a message. There is no time to be political. In fact, if you do, you risk loss of meaning, and there is no opportunity to do that. The consequences can be quite catastrophic in a newsroom. And I think there's something we can take from that in organisations. Of course, you also talked, Hannah, about diplomacy. Being abrasive and being diplomatic might be a difficult challenge for leaders, but again, a tension that we have to deal with. And trust. Hannah talked about momentum being lost when trust is broken. I'm sure we'll all recognise that in the organisations we work with. And more importantly, what builds trust? What builds trust with the people we work with? So that credibility in somebody's role that reliability, so people doing what they say they will do. People are incredibly cynical when that doesn't happen. And that relationship you have with people, that intimacy, which is often undermined when people have sort of a high degree of self-interest or that that's noticeable by people. And so finally, what about how the role of breaking news is different? So there's been lots of parallels, but I think there are lots of differences or a few key differences. Firstly, broadcast journalists represent the public and they've got a duty to them. They rarely, rarely have to answer the tough questions themselves. In fact, Hannah talked about playing devil's advocate, asking the politician the opposite point to that which they've just communicated. And that makes me think of us as employees, mistrusting and cynical of spin. Think about the way we receive and access communication nowadays in our everyday life. I think that's created an increased increased difficulty actually for leaders 
as employees, as people, we can get hold of news when we want. When we go to the doctor, we know what's wrong with us. People come into organisations and they expect a different level of communication from their leaders. Secondly, Hannah described as the presenter, she's largely talking to the camera and doesn't have to deal with somebody's immediate emotional response. So it's great to have gone through all that preparation and have that simple message. Actually, as leaders, we're dealing with people and people's emotional reaction to something. David from Oracle talked earlier about technology and how that has transformed our working lives, which I think is a fantastic thing and has made things incredibly efficient. What I do know, what I do believe, is that no amount of technology, no amount of technological infrastructure will replace an honest conversation with your boss or with somebody you work with. In fact, I'm pretty confident that nobody goes home from work and says, I've read a brilliant newsletter today, I've seen a great story on the internet. I imagine, though, they might remember a proper conversation they've had with somebody who cares about them. And finally, journalists are paid to be impartial, and at their best they are. Leaders are paid to be influencers. They are paid to set out a compelling vision, a direction of travel, if you like, and convince people, persuade people, that that direction is worthwhile. Their job, in fact, is rhetoric and influencing and persuasion. The risk with that, of course, is spin and the erosion of trust and the very fine line for leaders to tread. I think it all comes down to being authentic, but I think that word has become way too fashionable, actually, and almost a tick box exercise in organisations. Now, am I being authentic? Is he being authentic? I'm not sure if we have to talk about it if we are being authentic. Before you get a chance to ask some questions of Hannah, I'll leave you with two rhetorical questions. How prepared are your leaders to break news under pressure like a broadcast journalist and to answer questions like it's the journalist asking them? Thank you.